All right. Um, so I am going to uh, introduce our first presenter for the day, which is Andrew Rowan, who is the president of Wellbeing International, and he's going to talk about global cat management. And before I get into that introduction, I just I look at Andrew as an incredible leader within the uh, region, within the world. He has just really he always has directed me towards the numbers over the years. Um, most of his strategic decision making revolves around the round looking at the numbers first, which um, so I admire. I'm amazed by the work that he has done. Um, that he he's been involved in animal welfare for so many years. So I'm just incredibly thrilled and honored that he is here and willing to join us today. Um, so uh, Dr. Andrew Rowan has more than 40 years of experience in animal welfare science and in animal welfare environmental advocacy. He served on many government and corporate consult, consultative committees in um, on numerous boards of national and international NGOs and most recently served as the CEO of Humane Society International for 20 years and as the board chair of the Humane Society Wildlife Land Trust. Dr. Rowan was a professor at Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine where he established the Tufts Center for Animals and Public Policy, launched an academic journal on human animal relations, launched the first master's degree in the world on animals and public policy, and served for several years as chair of the Department of Environmental Sciences. He has authored or co-authored numerous books and over 100 academic papers. He is the recipient of the Rhodes Scholarship and has received numerous awards for his work. Uh, Dr. Rowan, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you very much, Stacey. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to be here with you. And, uh, you know, I'd like to sort of just comment on all the great work that you've done over the years as well. So uh, maybe maybe not as much as 40. You're a lot younger than I am, but uh, uh, certainly uh, being, being, being there with uh, in, in spades uh, on the animal protection world. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. And um, uh, it's great to be with everybody, even if we're uh, talking about the new COVID normal of a Zoom go to webinar, whatever these, uh, these, these calls are. Um, so I, so Stacy asked me to talk about global cat uh, management, and um, I've been sort of dabbling in this area uh, for a, for a while now, and and so this was uh, it took me a little bit longer than I thought it would to develop a a slide presentation on this particular topic um, because I had to sort of then go back and sort of look in specifics at some of the issues that are going globally rather than simply in the United States. I do have some material on the United States, so I'm going to talk briefly about global cat demographics. Um, I'm going to talk about the different populations of domestic cats. I'm going to talk about cat management. Mostly that, uh, nearly all of that comes from the United States. Uh, talk about cat management in wildlands, the feral cats specifically, uh, and then compare um, sort of say cat policies in the United Kingdom, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, being perhaps the, the sort of foremost active countries in this space at the moment. Uh, although um, we do have um, the, a presentation from Greece. And so, so there's a lot of work going on globally in this space. Um, one of the things that I've been a huge um, promoter of is the fact that we need an, um, more data on what works and what doesn't work. And this has been particularly problematic in the TNR space. Um, for a while, almost all of the material that was coming out on TNR came through from uh, wildlife uh, biologists, conservation biologists, and it was all negative. And there was very little that was published by um, those who sort of do TNR. Uh, Julie Levy was an exception to that. Um, but um, other than that, uh, there was almost nothing being published. That's changed now. Uh, so Peter Wolf at Best Friends and Dan Spiha, um, who I would happy to say is a, a graduate of um, uh, the Humane Society University and also of Tufts. I think he was a graduate of Tufts, the, the, the master's program. But also um, uh, um, uh, Jackie Rand out in Australia has been doing a lot of publication in the space. So there's, there's it's now a more sort of balanced picture in the academic literature. Um, but still, it's something that we have a major problem with, is sort of tracking what's happening over time. Typically, if you do a TNR project, 
Um, it takes two, three, four, five, ten years even to see actual real change in what's going on. And very few projects last that long or report data for that length of time. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a major deficit in the field, and one that I would urge people to be careful about collecting data, be systematic in collecting data, and then report it in whatever way you feel most comfortable uh, doing. But reporting it absolutely and keep it in a systematic fashion over at least five years, I hope preferably 10 years or longer. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, the, uh, so global cap demographics. So in terms of um, the numbers, I've taken the numbers here that come from the Mars um, Ending Pet Homelessness uh, website. This is a new website. Mars has been um, promoting this idea of ending pet homelessness, both dogs and cats. And th these are the numbers on, on their website. So the website is there. It's endpethomelessness.com. And um, the, they have these numbers for nine countries. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical about the 150 million pet cats in China. Uh, the number of pet cats in China and pet dogs has been growing very rapidly in the last 10 years. But I, would, I suspect it's closer to 80 million than 150 million. But this is, these are the numbers on the Mars website. And, and when you add up those numbers, um, for pet cats and the stray and feral cats, you end up for those nine countries with 274 million pet cats and 117 million stray and feral cats. Um, the, if you then extrapolate from the population of people in those countries to the world population, you get a total pet cat population of 582 million. I suspect it's high. I suspect the real pet cat population in the world is somewhere between 400 and 500 million. And then stray and feral cats, about 250 million. Most people would think that that was low. Um, there's a, a lot of exaggerated claims about dogs, for example. There are more pet dogs than there are homeless dogs uh, roaming on the streets. Uh, but everybody seems to think that there are more homeless dogs roaming on the streets than pet dogs. So it's, it, it, there's, a, a, there's a real problem in terms of how we um, look at cat demographics. And this is an example of one of those problems. So in the United States, we have various outfits that um, uh, collect, do surveys on pet population. AVMA is one of those outfits. They do it every five years. And I've extrapolated. This is now not a total cat population. This is a rate of cat, uh, pet cat keeping. And it's expressed in terms of the number of pet cats per thousand people. And I find that using these rate analyses are far more uh, valuable and illustrative than looking at total numbers, because the total number of both dogs and cats goes up as the human population goes up. Um, but that's not the that's not that really interesting metric. The me interesting metric are the rates, either the percentage of households with uh, cats or dogs, and the, the number of cats and dogs per thousand people. So you can see here that from 1975 to 1972, the number of pet cats jumped from about 150 per thousand up to eventually over 250 per thousand. But then what happened was um, the AVMA did a, a, an adjustment to their pet cat population numbers in 2016. And it came down to 58.4 million total cats in the country, down from 81.4 million in 2006. I don't think that the cat population dropped by 23 million uh, in that period of time. I think this is merely an artifact of how the surveys were conducted and that the AVMA corrected that artifactual um, problem in 2016. And that really what we've had is we've had around about 200 cats per thousand people in the country uh, for the last 40 years or so. Um, and so, so that's, these are some, show some of the problems about how we measure and report cats. And typically people just simply report cats how many cats there are in the country at any one time. It's a, it's a point um, uh, estimate. And um, then they sort of say, oh, it's gone down or gone up the next time the, the survey is done. That's not the way these things work. Uh, in fact, if you look again at 
a rate, the sort of cats, a percentage of households owning cats. Here are two different surveys. One, uh, the orange uh, points are the AVMA's survey points, and the blue points are the American Pet Products Association survey points. And you can see that the numbers are diverging. Um, AVMA says it's going down. Uh, APPA says it's go uh, the percentage of households with cats is going up. Um, there are other surveys that agree with the AVMA and say that actually the number of pet cats in the United States or the percentage of households with pet cats in the United States is somewhere around 25, 26 percent, rather than the 36 to 38 percent you see here in the APPA estimate. And again, it shows, we, you know, we can't really tell who's correct because the, there hasn't been sufficient careful analysis of this and there hasn't been sufficient reporting of methods for us to sort of determine, okay, who is the, what's the appropriate number here? So when you go out and say, oh, there's all these cats around, um, be careful, because I suspect that the numbers are sort of problematic and, and not particularly precise. And it's something that we need to address more carefully as we move forward. Um, here's another example. So the, this, this is an interesting analysis because the MSPCA did surveys in the same years that the AVMA did surveys of both dogs and cats. Only the MSPCA used a different technique from the AVMA. They used a random digit dial. That's where they just dialed uh, telephone numbers randomly and then asked whether people had dogs and cats, and if so, how many. And the, the MSPCA estimates are typically somewhere between 60 to 50 percent of the AVMA estimates. AVMA's method was to look at household panels. These are panels of households that have agreed to do um, full out surveys. Typically, you get a very high rate of return from those, those surveys, um, but the households in those panels have to be relatively stable. They've had to have lived in the home for at least a year, and so they're more likely to have um, the cats. And what you see here is um, that sort of a, about a 20%, 25% greater number of cats um, in the household panel surveys than in the random digit dial surveys. So again, can't say which one is correct because um, no, we don't have the sort of gold standard of um, survey methods being used here at this point in time. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, and I, I, I have my own opinions, but I'm not going to sort of plow the issue with my opinions. I'm just going to say that be careful when you start saying, oh, there are X number of cats, because you're probably going to be wrong. The good news here is that in the United States, the, um, the, the sort of shelter cat intake has um, been declining since 1970. And I've got a series of different data sets that come from different parts of the country. So we've got uh, Alachua County in Florida, you've got New Jersey, you have New Hampshire, you have San Mateo County in California, California as a, as a state and so on. And you can see that the trend lines are all pretty much down. Uh, they, they differ in their sort of uh, timing, but pretty much all of the lines are going down so that the, just the number of cats uh, per thousand people entering shelters in San Mateo County in 1970 was 40. Um, today, you've got somewhere between three to about 11 cats per thousand people entering shelters. And the trend line, as you can see, is, is basically going down. Um, and one of the interesting aspects of this is that uh, when you hear wildlife conservation biologists talking about cats, they all talk about how the cat numbers are increasing. If the shelter intake represents how many cat, outdoor cats there are out there, then the cat numbers can't be increasing. They're actually going down. But um, that's, again, a number that is, can be challenged. And you can't say for sure that the shelter, that the outdoor cat numbers are declining. In Europe, we have um, uh, the FEDIAT, which is the trade association for the pet food companies. And they do surveys of uh, of uh, dog and cat, pet dog and cat, and other and birds and other pet populations uh, annually. And then in 1981, a, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Peter Messant, did a survey in, Euro in several of the European countries. And I've got, again, these are cats per thousand people. 
So these are relative numbers, these are rate of numbers. And as you can see, Austria um, went up from 150 cats per thousand to around about 200 to 230 cats per thousand um, in, the, in, the, in the last decade. And you can see that there have been a, a number of the countries, their numbers went up between 81 and 2010. Um, and then sort of for the last 10 years have been pretty stable. I mean, you can the numbers jump around a bit, say Hungary, it's 226 in 2010, it's 241 in 2020, and they sort of bounce around a bit in between. In Greece, only 55 to 56, 58, Turkey, only 41. Um, and so there are these differences from one country to another. Ireland is 66, so the Irish I don't like pet cats uh, as much as the Hungarians do. So it's Again, we don't really understand why these relative numbers change, but what I would argue and sort of my basic conclusion is that for the most part, these relative rates of pet cat keeping are not, do not change within the country. They stay pretty, pretty stable over the years. So uh, they, they've gone up since 1981, but then they sort of stabilized at a particular value and sort of stayed there for the last decade. And I suspect it will continue to stay there. Um, so that, um, again, it's important for us, A, to understand <laughs> these, these demographics, but B, it's important to sort of also recognize that there are differences between, um, say, one country and another and another that, as to how many pet cats they report having. In, uh, in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Japan, China, uh, you can see that Japan um, has been, and China uh, more recently, have both shown a big jump in pet cat numbers. There's been a big change in pet cat keeping. New Zealand has, all, has generally been the country with the largest number of pet cats in the world in terms of relative rate, um, 300, 350 in 2010, 242 in 2016. And as I, as I keep saying, these numbers fluctuate and jump around depending on who does the survey. And it's a problem. And it's one that we need to sort of pay attention to uh, much more closely. In Australia, you can see it's around about 139, 160, 160. Um, and the, again, variations from one part of the world to another. And we don't understand why. So, that's just a, a brief sort of discussion of um, the, uh, the challenges of counting pet cats. Um, and the challenges of counting non-pet cats are even greater. So I, I want to divide the, uh, the cat populations into pet cats, um, those that are homed, kept in homes, generally sort of kept, provide, provisioned and provided for and given uh, uh, veterinary care and the stray and feral cat populations. And so um, the, what you see about pet cats is that there are high numbers in Western and Eastern Europe, generally North America and Australia, New Zealand, low numbers in Latin America and Africa, and the Asian countries are very mixed. India has low, very low numbers of pet cats, relatively speaking, but China has high numbers of pet cats by comparison to India, but still lower than Australia, New Zealand or North America. Then we talk about the stray and feral cat populations. And the cats around the strays, typically, I think we need to determine or sort of uh, look at cats that live in and around human communities. They may be stray, they may be feral, they may be socialized, they may not be. And then the cats that live out in the wild lands. And these definitely are not um, socialized, these are typically the same as any wild animal, any wild species that you're going to have out there. So um, there are different needs and different issues that we need to address when we talk about these cats out in the wild areas versus the cats that live in and around human communities or around a farmhouse or something of that nature. Um, so the, the density of cats in, in and around human communities tends to be high, 100 cats per square kilometer, up to 1,000 to 2,000 cats per square kilometer. Whereas the cats living in wildlands, their densities tend to be very low, under one per square kilometer. And it's 
it's clear, it should be clear to anybody that if you've got a thousand cats per square kilometer, it's going to be a lot easier to trap and manage those cats in terms of um, just the time and effort that you need to trap those cats and then sterilize them versus um, going out into the boonies of Australia or New Zealand and trapping cats that uh, are around at very low densities. It's going to take a lot more effort and a lot more time and a lot more money. So managing pet cats, we're looking at cat welfare mostly, and um, sterilization is one of the um, methods that um, people uh, sort of promote in terms of managing pet cats and avoiding uh, these large numbers of cats entering sheltering systems or uh, going stray. That uh, uh, the stray, stray population tends, if you go out and trap strays, most of the cats that you trap will be healthy and relatively well provisioned. Um, some, there'll be a few that won't be. Uh, Julie Levy found that of the sort of thousands of cats that she's uh, sterilized in and around um, Gainesville in, in Florida, um, most of them are pretty healthy, uh, but some are not. Um, but the, the big issue for the stray population isn't so much the adult cats, it's the kittens. Kitten mortality tends to be very high. So TNR has an immediate impact on cat welfare in terms of eliminating um, kittens that are born and then die. Um, and then the other aspect about cat welfare is keeping them indoors. And this is an interesting policy issue because it differs very much from one country to another, um, whether or not we should keep our cats indoors and how. Um, uh, the UK tends to frown upon keeping cats indoors, and Europe in general says that an indoor cat is in a state of poor welfare, um, and that comes from animal behavior studies. People say that cats show lots of um, bad behavior characteristics when they're kept indoors. Uh, they don't have to. We can do a much better job of keeping cats indoors. And so, such for example, in Portland, where they provide catios, where there's this big catio um, uh, craze uh, to allow one's cat to be outside without necessarily interfering with wildlife. Uh, catios aren't the only, uh, only possible solution to protect wildlife from a roaming outdoor pet cat. Uh, colored birds uh, appear to have a very um, good impact in terms of preventing cats from catching um, wildlife. Uh, one, one owner commented on their cat once had a colored bib. It, it, after attempting to catch uh, wildlife, wild animals for a while, it finally decided this was now a fruitless exercise and stopped even attempting to hunt wildlife. And so just lay around on the porch um, watching what was going on outside, but didn't they, didn't try to catch anything. Um, and then the other option is to feed a high protein diet. A study in England indicated that um, cats that were fed a high protein diet did less hunting than cats that weren't. So, so there are options that one can can implement in terms of managing um, a cat wildlife welfare and, uh, and your cat welfare at the same time. So it's so there are these these different approaches to um, how we might manage um, uh, our cats both indoors and outdoors. So the the majority of outdoor cats. Uh, I, I did an assessment of um, the number of outdoor cats in the United States, basically using um, uh, sort of ass assumed um, population densities. Um, in and around human habitation and in, in national forests or farmland or places like that. And, and the country is divided. You can find out how much countryside is a national forest versus how much is farmland versus how much is urban. And what you find when you do that, and I assumed that cats out in the wildlands were present at a, at a density of less than one cat, about one cat per thousand and that cats were living in and around human habitation were present at a density of 100 cats per, 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 per square kilometer. And so um, when you do that, you find that you, you come up with a, an estimate that there are about 32 million outdoor cats in the country, 
and that 24 million of them live in and around uh, human communities. There's, there are only 8 million living in um, the sort of wild areas of the country. So, I mean, that's still a lot of cats, but it's not, um, uh, it, it's not a, as daunting a, a challenge as some of the claims that there are 80 to 100 million cats outdoors. And as I say, three quarters of the cats outdoors are living in and around human communities, which by and large are not the places where we're finding endangered species. So uh, Hawaii is different, the uh, Florida uh, Keys are different, but by and large, um, when cats are living in and around human communities, they're, they're not catching endangered animals. Um, and so, um, and also the cats that are living in and around human communities, that's where lots of humans are, that's where uh, you've got a, a, a fairly active um, trap and neuter and, and trap and adop adoption programs running. Lots of volunteers who do this. Uh, when you ask the public whether or not they feed outdoor cats, about 10 to 15 percent of households say they do. And um, a percentage of those will um, help with TNR uh, programs and trapping and, uh, and sterilization. So, so there's a, there's a frankly huge workforce um, that you can have. I was asked once by a wildlife biologist, what would I do if I had unlimited um, resources? And I said, well, frankly, compared to the wildlife people, I do have, we do have unlimited resources. We have about one million households that are willing to work, uh, volunteer and help with trapping and neutering. And you have uh, the, the animal protection world in the United States uh, raises and spends about four to five billion dollars a year, of which at least 25 percent is focused on cats. So, I mean, you're talking about one billion dollars a year plus uh, one million households. That's a fairly substantial resource base uh, that one can use to address um, the outdoor cat population. And as I indicated in the uh, cats entering shelters, the number of cats entering shelters has dropped dramatically um, during the COVID pandemic in, in 2020, there were shelters in the Northeast with hardly any cats in them. So it's, so it's, we're having a major impact in terms of um, the outdoor cat population. We just haven't documented what that impact is for the most part. Then what we can, what we can do about feral cats in wild areas, usually low densities, um, we can leave them alone. Um, and there are some who advocate that. Uh, you can try lethal control. So the Australians have developed a number of poisons that uh, can be used to uh, control uh, cats, including, for example, what they call the Felixer, which is a, uh, a, a device that sprays uh, a poison onto the cat's fur, and when the cat grooms, it, it ingests the poison and dies. And then there are some interesting new technologies. Um, so using uh, genetic engineering, of, uh, technologies that could be used to introduce sterile uh, animals into uh, the environment and prevent the production of new kit of kittens uh, uh, as a result. These are still pretty, um, uh, in a, uh, still pretty early stages of development, not clear how they might work, not clear whether they would work. Um, uh, and so, but there are these new ideas that are coming up to try and address cat problems uh, in, in the world. So, some examples of pet cat management in the United States. Um, one of the interesting data sets comes up from the ASPCA, that was the animal, shelter, animal control um, organization in New York City for 100 years. And, um, and then it was handed over to the CCAC um, at, in New York City. But if you look at the intake, and those are the orange dots there, and again, this is cats per thousand people, so it's a standardized number. You can see that there were 35 cats per thousand people c coming into shelters back in the early 1900s. That number dropped dramatically. And most of our data starts in about 1980. So um, we're only, um, the data that we have from most shelters in the country um, is at the at tail end of the uh, reduction in cat number, shelter intakes. 
um, if you use the New York City um, data as a sort of historical example. But you can see that the intake has been going down uh, this century, and the number of uh, the euthanasia has dropped dramatically as well. So, the, generally speaking, um, we're doing very well in terms of managing outdoor cats. San Mateo shows something similar. So, these are data that come from Peninsula Humane, which is um, the, the major shelter in the San Mateo County, south of San Francisco. And uh, back in 1970, they, were take, they took in over 40 cats per 1,000 people, and that dropped dramatically in the 1970s. And that drop was, I believe, in, caused by the um, development of spay neuter clinics. Um, uh, and, but more importantly, the development of municipal spay neuter clinics led to local veterinary practices saying, oh, we've got to compete with these spay neuter clinics. And so they started sterilizing animals as well. And the majority of animals, dogs and cats that were sterilized in the 1970s were sterilized by private clinics, not by the uh, municipal clinics. But the municipal clinics were the stimulus that got the private clinics to change their behaviors. Um, and then you can see that it's sort of the number of cats coming into shelters plateaued from around about 1980 to about 1994. And TNVR really started in around about 94, 95. And you can see that while the numbers sort of jump around a bit, um, there's been a general decline in cat intake um, from uh, the uh, 1995 down to 2020. And we're now looking at about two to three cats per thousand people being taken into San Mateo. So uh, a tr tremendous change um, and one that uh, the animal protection world should be very proud of. One of the projects that is typically brought up that the wildlife biologists typically say doesn't, doesn't, is not proof that TNR works is this one in the University of Central Florida campus in Orlando. Um, and so it's 1,400 acres, 35,000 students, 3,200 employees, a lot of people, and 155 free roaming cats when the project started in 1995. They they removed um, uh, so they removed about 90 cats um, from the campus, uh, 87 specifically, or 87 specifically, um, and either euthanized or uh, adopted and then returned 68 cats back to the campus. And since 1995, this is the population chart for those six, so 68 cats. It's now down to around about 10 cats, a little bit, a little bit fewer. Um, and um, the, uh, again, this, this, is, uh, this is shows that TNR uh, has worked on the uh, University of Central Florida campus. There were a total of 204 cats, so 155 to start with. Another um, 50, 49 um, came uh, joined, came onto the campus during this period from 95 to 2019, um, and of those, 170 were sterilized. Um, the total of the 204, 95 were adopted, 62 disappeared, 23 were euthanized, and 24 some other fate. So it's this is a demonstration that it works, although if you're a wildlife uh, biologist, you'll say, well, there are still 10 cats there, but it hasn't quote unquote worked. It hasn't eliminated the cat population, but um, it certainly has had a major impact on the cat population, and we didn't have a lot of influx of new cats into onto the campus uh, during that period. There was some, but by and large, it was it was it was not a pro it was not did not increase the cat population on the campus. Uh, the sterilization uh, did work to sort of lower the cat population. And the cats that are there now are generally older and not particularly interested in hunting wildlife. Another project, this one in Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon is a very interesting place. I'm not sure you've, everybody knows about it, is that um, the uh, um, You've got the Portland Audubon and the Feral Cat Coalition um, working together to um, to address outdoor cat issues. One of the few places there are others. Um, Julie Levy in 
Gainesville is working with uh, wildlife biologists, um, uh, and there are a couple of others who've been able to sort of develop a productive, constructive uh, coalition. Um, but this is the one that is sort of ground zero for uh, constructive um, programs between feral cat um, advocates and wildlife advocates. And it's, it's, it's basically because of Bob Salinger at the Portland Audubon. He, he sort of admits that he feels uncomfortable working on this issue, but uh, uh, working with the Feral Cat Coalition. But he says this is the only way we're going to actually have it make a difference. And they've chosen this island in the Columbia River in Portland as a test site. And it's 4.4 square kilometers. They estimate there are somewhere between 320 and 540 outdoor cats on the island. But, and here is the kicker, very few of those cats actually are in the wild, in that area. You see the island has a built up section on the bottom right and the sort of natural section on the top. And there are very few cats in the wild area. And in fact, that's, that's not unusual. Uh, in uh, Chicago, um, a study of coyotes and cats found that the cats tended to stay away from the, the parkland where the coyotes were. Uh, not surprisingly, they learned that that wasn't a good place for a cat to be. And if you look at the actual cat numbers, cat census, this is a, a plot of how many cats there are, um, uh, either during the daytime or the nighttime. And you can see that all of the cats are in these two, and these are two mobile home communities, by the way. Um, there are a lot of cats in those two mobile home communities. Down on the right-hand tip of the island, um, that's a, a high-income area, a large uh, some apartment blocks and things like that. Relatively few cats down there. They're mostly in and around the urban communities, and there's almost no dots uh, seen up in the left-hand area where the, the sort of natural area starts. So um, moving on to the United Kingdom and cat management, the, uh, uh, when uh, the Cat Wars appeared, the book by Peter Mara and Chris Antella, uh, the reaction in the UK was decidedly lukewarm. Um, in fact, the Royal Society for Protection of Birds specifically contradicted the claims being made in Cat Wars and released the statement that said that basically yeah, cats kill birds, but these are birds that would have died anyway. And so it's this, this is not additive predation. It's um, predation. Uh, so the, what the cats will be doing is they'll be competing with the stoats and the weasels and other small predators in terms of um, uh, killing the birds uh, that would have been killed by a stoat or a weasel. So they probably had an impact on the small predator population but not so much on the bird population. And I'd note that TNVR started in Denmark, but it was, a, was adopted most enthusiastically in the UK in the 1970s and 1980s. And, and that's, where, that's where it re tended, originated in Denmark, but then sort of was developed in the UK. So I, I frankly think that we um, have a, uh, a handle on cats in and around urban areas um, and around farm, farmhouses and so on. Um, and we know how to manage the cats and it may not be perfect and it may not happen overnight. Uh, typically it will take five, 10 years before you see a major change in population. But um, it, it will happen if you're systematic and sustained. Um, but wildland is, cats in wildlands, that's a different challenge. Um, New Zealand and Australia both talk about these things because they have populations of animals and species that have evolved without uh, any major mammalian predator. And, and so the argument here is made that the, uh, these populations are less competent and that cats will outcompete them or outpredate them fairly quickly. Um, both of New Zealand and Australia don't only have cats, they have a number of different species. So Australia has foxes. Um, New Zealand um, has, um, has a, uh, a stoat. Um, and uh, of course you have rats and, and mice on both islands, uh, both countries that uh, are also problematic when it comes to um, sort of vulnerable species that are not particularly 
uh, don't have the evolutionary advantage of um, having evolved with uh, a major mammalian predators. Um, so in, in New Zealand and Australia, uh, well, in Australia specifically, the cat advocates for wildlife biologists tend to talk past each other. In New Zealand, the cat advocates and the wildlife biologists have developed a modus operandi and are talking to one another. They've developed a sort of cat policy approach that incorporates TNR or TNDR, but it's it's um, there's still a little bit of edginess in terms of how these issues are discussed. And New Zealand in general uh, has established this predator-free um, policy. They want to be predator-free by 2050. So it's not clear what they're going to do about cats in that thing. They're currently out there trying to poison the stoats and the possums and other invasive species that have been brought in by humans uh, and, uh, and allowed to go wild or deliberately introduced to address a problem, i.e. with rats and mice. So the, uh, in Australia, um, the, the discussion between cat advocates and wildlife advocates is much more contentious. And uh, the government is firmly on the side of the wildlife advocates and has been funding research into trying, looking to see what could happen or what one could do with um, outdoor cat populations. And you can see here that graph uh, on the slide shows the increase in um, publications dealing with cats and cat management uh, in, the, in, in Australia since uh, 2010. It's a big increase in the last decade. Uh, one of the things that the Australian wildlife biologists have done, which is a real advance, is that they actually went out and developed a count of cats in the wildlands of Australia, you know, farmlands and wildlands of Australia. And they estimated, finally, um, the New Zealand politicians and everybody was saying there were 20 million cats out, feral cats in New Australia. Um, when they finally went out and did a careful count, they came up with somewhere between 1.4 and 5.6 million feral cats. And the number goes up um, when there are good rains and there's more animals out there for cats to catch and more, more of the feral cat kittens survive. Um, but then they go down when the, during the dry periods. Uh, and so that's why you have that fourfold range of, of outdoor cat populations. There were 700,000 feral strays in urban suburban areas and 3.8 million pet cats. So um, only in, in, in the urban suburban areas, um, only about 20% uh, of the cats are feral strays um, outdoors. The rest are pet cats, which may be outdoors roaming. Um, but nonetheless, the ferals and strays is relatively limited by comparison with the United States, where you've got 38 million or 40, 32 million outdoor cats and 58 million pet cats. So, um, so the cats kill a large number of vertebrates. Um, Two billion vertebrates is the estimate, and pet cats were killing 390 million. So um, this, the, these are large sort of eye-popping numbers. Um, of course, we don't really know how many vertebrates die every year anyway. Um, and it, we really need to have some of those relative numbers or sort of gross numbers so that we can see just how important a 2 billion, um, shall we say, carnage might be in terms of overall um, vertebrate populations and vertebrate um, rates of decline and uh, or rates of growth. Toxoplasmosis is another issue that uh, keeps coming up in the cat debate. Um, and um, toxo has this interesting quality that it affects behavior. Um, and uh, for example, um, when, when uh, rodents are infected with toxoplasmosis, they're attracted to cat urine, i.e. they're makes cats, it makes it easier for cats to uh, catch them. Um, and the toxo has been identified also implicated in uh, human psychiatric issues, um, but it's not clear just how uh, important that is. There's still a lot of argument about that. But toxo nonetheless is, is an issue that we need to be aware of and need to sort of address when we're talking about outdoor cat management. And in Australia, the estimate is that they're killing 300,000 feral cats annually. 
that's a fairly large sum. If you've got 1.4 million feral cats, you're killing about 20% of the population every year. Uh, but probably not having any impact on the overall population because it's too small. 20% uh, is a relatively minor um, proportion of the population and probably will not have any absolute um, impact. And so it's not clear how this is how this is going to work um, in terms of managing um, cat populations in Australia. There have been eradicating cats off islands. Um, typically, uh, eradication of cats off islands started in the 1970s, and the most recent in Australia was the Dirk Hartog Island out in Western Australia, which is the largest island that has uh, to date had cats eradicated. 630 square kilometers. Um, so it's um, it, it's a, um, a challenging area. Um, up until that time, uh, the largest islands were Marion and, and uh, Macquarie Islands, uh, which were the only islands over 100 square kilometers. So most of the islands where cats have been eradicated have been small islands, um, uh, and the cat population was relatively small. Uh, they're now trying to eradicate cats from Kangaroo Islands, the kangaroo, which is the, uh, the island um, you know, just off South Australian coast. You can see it in the map down. It's a little blip at the bottom of South Australia. And Kangaroo Island itself is, uh, has this Dudley Peninsula, and they're looking to sort of eradicate cats from the Dudley Peninsula. Uh, the actual number of cats on Kangaroo Island, uh, wild cats, are 244 pet cats um, in 40, living with 4,200 people. Um, there are about 1,600 um, uh, feral cats and a density of 0.37 cats per square kilometer. Again, see it's less than one cat per square kilometer. There are no foxes or rabbits on the island, and so as a result, um, the, uh, uh, the the population, the wildlife population, tends to be um, native species, with the, and the cats are um, fairly devastating in terms of going after the small rodent-like creatures that you find them uh, amongst the Australian uh, wildlife population. They started planning in 2016, the, the devastating wildfire fire on Kangaroo Island in 2019. 90% of people on the island support cat management, and as you can see, about 10% of the island is the Stadley Peninsula, and they're focusing on that as a place to where they would start cat eradication. As I mentioned, there have been successful eradicate, cat eradication campaigns on islands. Uh, one of them was San Nicolas Island, which is a, 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 one of the islands off um, the Southern California coast. Um, and the 57 cats that were trapped and, and removed were ended up in a, uh, a wildlife um, rehab center that was run by the Humane Society. Um, and I've, I'm not sure how many are still left, but um, they were able to adopt out some of the kittens, but most of the cats were not adoptable. And so they've been living their lives in, in the rehab center. Only about 20 of 80 of the islands were larger than 10 square kilometers. So the islands are small, tiny. Um, and Marion Macquarie and Dirk Hartog, which I didn't miss in this original set, slide set, those are the only three islands that are larger than 100 square kilometers. And so Kangaroo Island is the biggest challenge to date um, to, in terms of elimination. And we'll have to see what they're going to do. But they're using poisons, they're using the polyxa, the grooming, um, the device that sprays poison onto the cat uh, and ingested during grooming. So, so they've got several types of uh, uh, approaches, mostly poison, but they also have done some shooting um, of uh, feral cats. In terms of public policies and, and looking at, the, uh, at each of these countries, um, New Zealand, Australia, UK, and USA, um, you can see that the percentage of cat owning households differs dramatically from one country to the another. Um, the number of cats per thousand, um, according to a Euromonitor survey in 2012, um, has New Zealand at the top of the charts and Australia at the bottom. Uh, different part, 
surveys show New Zealand still at the top, but Australia no longer at the bottom. It's in the same place as the United Kingdom. Um, the percentage of cats sterilized is generally high. Um, the indoor only numbers, as you can see, vary dramatically from one country to another. And the percentage of cats microchipped vary um, significantly from one country to another. Um, so it's uh, gives a, a sort of picture of, um, shall we say, cat management in each of these four countries and, uh, and how, what we might try and do. This doesn't talk about the outdoor cat population, it's just looking at the, in, uh, at the pet cat population specifically. So in conclusion, um, I would say that population estimates are, are very problematic. We need much better and more reliable estimates. Um, and this is something that I'm, I'm constantly amazed by is how, how little discussion there is of, of this issue. For example, when the AVMA revised its estimate down from 81 million in, 20, in 2006 to 58 million in 2016, there was almost no discussion of that. And then, of course, that was a big difference between the numbers being uh, um, reported by the APPA, the American Pet Products Association, who were as high as 94 million cats versus 58 million for the AVMA. Again, almost no discussion. What you see is that uh, the, animal, the animal advocacy organizations simply report these numbers without any, without any commentary. And you're left with no guidance whatsoever as to whether this is good, bad, or indifferent, and whether the number actually means anything. And you know, somebody will say, oh, the cat population was 81 million in 2006 and 74 million in 2011, it went down. Well, that's not the way this stuff works. These estimates, need to, you need to look at, trend, uh, at the trends in the estimates and sort of come up with a, a reasoned conclusion as to whether or not these numbers make any sense. Um, so, so we need much better numbers in terms of cat populations. We need to distinguish between pet cats, stray cats, and feral cats in terms of our management approaches. And the ferals, specifically those that are living out in wildlands or uh, away from human habitation, uh, are going to be a particular challenge. Um, uh, and we should recognize, and the uh, cat advocacy world should recognize that managing these feral, those feral cats in wildlands is not going to be easy, it's going to be expensive, it's going to be difficult. And TNVR is not going to be the answer for those cats. For cats in and around human habitation, TNVR is, it, it has demonstrated its effectiveness. But um, the feral cats out in the wildlands is another matter altogether. The other thing about feral cats in wildlands is that they also will interbreed with um, wildcat species. So the African wildcat, um, from which the domestic cat uh, is different, if it has evolved, and the Scottish wildcat are both um, species that are in, in uh, significant decline, and much of the problem uh, derives from um, interbreeding between with domestic cats. Um, I, as I, when I was a boy growing up in Cape Town, one of our pets was a cat by the name of Tigger, who was rescued as a kitten from under a cabbage bush in my grandmother's garden, and my mother then raised Tigger with a, the aid of an eyedropper, um, feeding it, you know, sort of six, seven times a day. Um, and Tigger became a, a, shall we say, a brute. And my grandmother had two fox terriers who would kill a cat as soon as look at them. And Tigger and the two fox terriers came into contact several occasions, and Tigger was plainly dismissive of the fox terriers. Um, and uh, gave a better than he got uh, from the fox terriers. Uh, and he was, just a, he was just a terror when we moved into a suburbs um, in uh, south of in Cape Town, Claremont. Um, Tigger was grown, go out, he'd be gone for two, three days, and then come back and spend a day or two with us, and then go out roaming again. And eventually he never came back, but he terrorized the dogs in the neighborhood. Um, and I think Tigger, my mother always thought that Tigger was a cross between a domestic female and a wild, uh, an African wildcat. 
Um, and the African wildcat is threatened by um, interbreeding with domestic cats. Um, it's something that, uh, that we need to address. And the Scottish wildcat, there are some biologists who say there are no pure Scottish wildcats. It's all, uh, the ge genetics of the Scottish wildcat are now hopelessly mixed with domestic cat genetics. Um, but there are still people who are trying to save the Scottish wildcat, uh, maybe 50 to 100 individuals total in the country. Um, and then most importantly, um, in terms of actually addressing the cat issue, um, we need to develop much better relationships with conservation biologists. And I'm not sure precisely how this would happen. Um, I, I, I point to Portland as a classic example. There are other places where conservation biologists and, and cat advocates have, are working together, e.g. Um, Julie Beebe in um, uh, in Gainesville, Florida, uh, is working with local conservation biologists. But we need to really develop a, um, a much better relationship and stop fighting over the stuff. It's, it's ridiculous and unproductive for us to be sort of constantly in a battle with the conservation biologists. And I'm not saying that this is a, um, a problem of cat advocates. I mean, the conservation biologists give as good as they, as they get. But it's something that we need to sort of really consciously, I think, sort of say that we need to change the way we address these issues. And so that's um, that's it for my uh, uh, my slides. Be happy to answer any questions if anybody has. I like those go. conclusions. Um, if we could even get one out of those um, accomplished, I think we would be doing really well. So it's a good to-do list here, Andrew, um, yeah. <laughs> for sure. So um, I have a couple of technical questions, and then I will go into more theoretical questions um, with the group. Uh, you had referred to colored bibs. Can you describe more specifically what they are? I think I know what you were referencing, but I'd rather you tell us than me. Yeah, uh, it's it's basically a cloth uh, collar that uh, has different colors on it. It's, it's a boldly colored, and um, you know it's it's not just a single color. It's it's a multiple multi multicolored. Um, and I I ha hate to say it, but I haven't re I didn't really go back to that paper to sort of have a closer look at it. But I was intrigued. I think that the uh, cats with colored those colored bibs were much less successful to the tune that sort of caught 10% of the wildlife that they were catching before. And so, so it has dramatic effect on um, the uh, predatory ability of cats. Yeah, they're sort of like uh, floppy e-collars almost um, yeah, that are very yeah. colorful. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's basically a collar with, you know, a, a, a bit. It's like, you know, when your baby has a bib on it, it's, it's the same for the cat. Yep. Um, so a couple of times you had referenced, um, you know, shelter intake um, dropped. Therefore, we know that the, um, the number of cats needing TNR in that community uh, was going down. And I'm not sure that that's, I just want to confirm with you that's, uh, that's actually what you're saying, that, that as your intake numbers in shelters goes down, the number of community cats out there that need assistance or support, that it's uh, affirmed that that number is also going down, or we don't know that? We don't know that. Um, but the, the issue that I argue is that conservation biologists um, uh, typically claim that cat number, outdoor cat numbers are going up. And the shelter intake numbers actually sort of imply that cat numbers aren't going up, at the very least. Whether they're going down is another matter, but they're not going up. Um, if they were going up, then we, would, we should be seeing increased intake of cats into shelters rather than the opposite. And so the fact that there was this dramatic decline in shelter, in cat shelter intake from 1970 to today, um, uh, and mostly occurring between 1970 and 1980, um, but st some still occurring uh, from 1995 onwards. Um, that I think is a clear um, uh, sort of challenge to the claim that outdoor cat populations are increasing. But I, I, we can't conclude that the shelter numbers reflect the outdoor cat numbers. 
I sort of remember a period of time when um, the state plan was passed in New Hampshire, uh, and most of the adoption centers or the shelters in New Hampshire sort of overnight became limited admission. And so the statistics changed dramatically in that period of time. Um, but I do know that their uh, TNR programs within the state, um, there was a lot of catch up that had to happen very quickly. A lot of groups started very quickly right. to uh, adapt to a TNR movement because of the behavioral change of the shelter. And I think that a lot of folks through COVID are facing that behavior, not necessarily strategic, um, limited intake, but best limited intake based on the pandemic protocols. Right. And so I think there is a big concern that there is a greater population of cats out there on the streets because the shelters are uh, limiting their intake for a variety of different reasons. Um, do you feel like you are seeing that in the sort of the, the COVID numbers out there, seeing any sort of information or just we just don't even have that information? Well, we don't. I mean, the DC cat count has produced uh, its estimates and they're basically, I mean, it's interesting. So um, the AVMA pet cat surveys show, conclude that there's a certain number of pet cats within the District of Columbia. And the AVMA's number is about 60,000 pet cats. The DC cat count concludes there are 200,000 cats in the District of Columbia. Now that's a very big difference. And so sort of figuring out why the difference is so large is something that we should be, I, I clearly the DC cat count is the most systematic and intensive count of cats anywhere in the country. And so I think we should be going with what we're seeing in the DC cat count um, and then start to explore why those numbers are so different between the AVMA estimates and the DC estimates. But if you look at the DC cat count estimates, the, there's the relatively few outdoor and truly feral cats in, within in, in DC. And so um, I think it was about 10%. So out of 200,000 cats, you're looking at about 20,000 or 15,000 or whatever it was. I, I, right. The numbers have not been sort of internalized to the extent they should be. But um, the, uh, so, so it's a it's a very small number by comparison with the pet cat count, and uh, and, and that's not the way um, that people have been talking. They've been talking about oh you've got you know there's been estimates that there are 50 million pet cats, therefore there are 80 million outdoor cats and things like that. And so so, so again, uh, the DC cat count is something that um, we should, if not replicate, we should certainly attempt to sort of be more. Uh, systematic and uh, and focus in, in what's going on. And uh, you look at a place like um, Chicago. The Chicago, uh, this woman who's been sterilizing cats in a one mile square area of Chicago suburbs. She's had a significant impact on how many outdoor cats there are. And again, it's not a huge number. I mean, it was I think it was 185 in total in this one one mile square area. So, so it's, you know, if you start relating these numbers more to generally around the country, uh, you, we're not going to see uh, huge numbers. Uh, and the, uh, whether or not they're coming into shelters and return to freedom, of course, is, uh, is a major new approach. And so it's having an impact on what's coming into the shelter versus uh, what's being managed uh, outdoors. Um, it's it's going to be tricky to sort of really produce um, clear estimates, but if people do it for local areas, we can begin to extrapolate from local areas to sort of larger areas and begin to have a better sense of what's actually happening. But I suspect that we'll never know for sure why the pet, why the cat population intake drops as dramatically. And the 1970, I mean, there was the same dramatic decrease in animal, dogs and cats, intake into Los Angeles. It went from 140,000 to 80,000 in, in 10 years. Um, and you see the same declines in other state places, not as dramatic or not, as, not the same time span. It may occur 10 years later, but it's we, we see this big decline long before anybody said, well, we shouldn't be taking in feral cats or we shouldn't be doing this or we shouldn't be doing that. 
um, it happened a lot, much earlier than most of the, the policies that we we're, take for granted today. Um, there's also a mention out there from uh, Lost Cat Finder, Kim Freeman, talking about there are hologram collars that um, that she's put together, and then there are also LED lighted collars that help with the, uh, you know, scaring away of yeah. the uh, of the birds, especially, I guess. So just passing passing along that, um, and then um, all right, let me see here. Um, have there well, been I any? Sorry, go ahead. No, I just say, you know, the other thing about cat hunting, uh, uh, cat predation, is that it's very a, it, it's very asymmetric. If you have 10 cats, you know, two or three are going to be the, the main problem. And if you manage those two or three, um, you're going to reduce um, predation numbers dramatically. Um, okay, our, our, there was a great question here, and I've just... Is it? Have there been any studies on numbers uh, differentiating outdoor cats that may be lost versus um, feral? Uh, no, I mean, except the DC cat count. The DC cat count is your most um, uh, definitive estimation, and uh, and the stray and feral numbers in DC are low compared to the pet population. Here is a question with regards to your own policy thoughts. Do you support feral cat culling in wild areas? I think it's going to depend. Um, you know, it's feral cats um, on some of these islands where seabirds nest are, are a problem. Um, but I would point to say um, one, of the, one of the approaches that's used in Hawaii, uh, Lanai is an interesting island. Basically, the Lanai ecosystem was destroyed by cattle farming and pineapple farming. But um, there are still seabirds that nest the shearwater, um, that nest uh, ground nesting birds on the island. And what happened there was a local activist, um, there are only about 3,000 people living on Lanai, and they, they serve the three resorts on the island. Um, a local activist started trapping outdoor cats around the shearwater colonies and then placing them in a um, sort of a rehab center or just a sort of enclosed space in the center of the island. It was about an acre and a half of space. And then managing and sort of taking care of the cats in that space. Um, the cats, I visited the, the, the facility, the cats were all sort of, uh, there were a lot of cats that weren't particularly interested in engaging with humans, but there were a number of cats that were. The, this, Cat Sanctuary became a sort of one of the places that uh, resort visitors would visit if they wanted a, an afternoon cat fix. Um, and the resort visitors were, were part of the donors uh, that sort of supported the, the center. Um, and they pretty much had removed a lot of the outdoor cats and changed the relationship uh, there on the island. So the shearwaters were much more protected and more successful. Um, but it's, you know, you can only do that in a certain place, but maybe Hawaii is the sort of place where you could make a difference with uh, um, trapping the cats and keeping them in a uh, little sanctuary. Yeah, so uh, we're going to have lots of homework for everybody because uh, I did do a podcast with um, the folks from Portland, Oregon, um, and so we're going to share that podcast link, and I also did a podcast with the folks from the Lanai Sanctuary. And it was uh, interesting because they were at a point, I interviewed them maybe a couple of years ago, the uh, you know costs and the overhead for running and maintaining that sanctuary was sort of overwhelming them to the point where they were uh, not able to allocate as many resources to the trap neuter return or the trap yeah. neuter assistance part of their program. So, you know, that's one of those uh, examples too about resources. I always say, if you had a hundred dollars and you know, 10 cats, and, and it cost you $10, $10 to spay, neuter each cat, or you could do $20 and you'd vaccinate the cat, or not vaccinate, you'd test the cat and you would spay, right. neuter that cat. You know, how would you spend that $100? And the response I always get is, well, you know, we have more than $100. And I'm like, well, we don't have more than $100 at this point in time. You know, we want to spread the, uh, 
spay neuter wealth as much as possible. Um, and we get ourselves tied up in the costs for sheltering as well as you know sanctuaries or it's not a cheap business and so it, it can be very very expensive and if you are sacrificing your spay neuter resources to run those programs you know i'm not saying not to but i'm saying it creates additional challenges well i, I won't just say that lanai is no longer hurting for money yeah. when larry when larry ellison bought the island larry ellison was also a, a major donor towards the commercial like humane Peninsula Humane then became sort of essentially the overseers of <coughs> the Lanai Cat Sanctuary. And their budget's gone from 75,000 a year to 300,000 a year. So they're no longer hurting for money. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that, that that's very, that's good and that's helpful, but I still feel that their, their resources may be uh, still somewhat limited yeah. and maybe that's on their own directional choice. Um, before we close out, uh, we have an interesting question here for you. Uh, can you talk a bit about non-surgical sterilization methods and what you might know about what's being worked on? Sure. So um, the Michelson Foundation has, uh, is developing a, uh, a chemical sterilant um, based upon um, RNA technology. Um, and they're doing a trial now. It looks like it works very well. And they're doing a trial now to... Um, look at uh, its impact on a small colony of cats, six cats, and none of the cats have uh, become pregnant. So uh, the, the next step is to sort of take the numbers up a bit and perhaps do a field trial. And I would, you know, my suspicion is here that uh, going to a place like Hawaii would be a good place to start on something like this. But it's, it, it this is, this is the closest that uh, Michelson has come to uh, a sort of true chemical sterilant that will prevent f uh, fertilization, prevent the production of kittens. Um, I don't know how much it will cost. I don't know what the cost estimates are, that, and that they have to get it approved um, by the regulatory agencies. And it's a, it's a, it's an interesting challenge because um, the these anti-fertility agents have now been managed by the EPA as pesticides. Um, and this is something that when I was at the Humane Society, we were always a little bit edgy about uh, that um, um, these contraceptives were now being managed as pesticides. We didn't like the idea, but it was a way to get out from under the FDA regulatory system and go to a, a system that was a little less um, challenging. And so though, the, I guess it will be um, over, over to the EPA to determine whether or not this is an adequate um, contraceptive or steroid. So we'll see. I mean, it's, uh, it's still about a year or two, at least, I suspect, to go before it's ready for uh, widespread implementation. But it's, it's promising development, and I don't know what, what the relative cost structure will be. Well, we have a few minutes left. If you could share with folks a little bit about Wellbeing International um, and some of the work that your organization does. I know it goes far beyond uh, looking at cats. I know you've got involvement with dogs and a lot of work there. So if you want to share a little bit about your organization, if people want to find out more where they should go. Okay, well, they have the uh, website listed on the slide at the bottom right-hand corner. So um, you can go to the website. Uh, we're basically, uh, when, you know, when I left the Humane Society, there were still some things that I, I wanted to continue working on. And um, a global dog campaign was one of them. So that became one of our major sort of campaigns of Wellbeing International. But Wellbeing International is pushing the notion that um, we can't solve these solutions just looking at one section of the world, i.e. people or animals or the environment. We have to look at all three and uh, in order to develop s solutions that are sustainable and um, effective. And so uh, with the dog, Global Dog Campaign, it's perhaps the least compelling of uh, the campaigns that we have that are sort of focusing on um, all three. But even so, um, it, we find that if you, uh, you know, sort of manage uh, street dogs and reduce street dog populations, um, what you find happening is that um, uh, human bite rates, uh, dog bite rates diminish, decline in the community. Um, the dogs are less aggressive. The, the dogs are less likely to go out and chase wildlife. 
So it still has this overarching benefit for humans, animals, and the environment. Um, we also have uh, developed a, uh, a repository that's sort of featuring all three elements, human well-being, environmental sustainability, and animal well-being. Um, the, uh, the Well-being International Studies Repository, this is something that has about 5,500 5, items in it. They're all open access. You can go to that, download whatever you want. There's material on cats there. So it's not a huge collection at this point in time, but we're building it up. And we're hoping to make um, that a much more uh, uh, useful um, set of materials for people. Uh, and it's mostly sort of pointy headed science stuff. But I mean, um, the hope is that um, people can make you know, sort of use of it um, in, in a way and sort of begin to identify what it is that they want to do and how they might want to do it. And then we're looking at um, individual behaviors. So we have a Feel Better campaign where the idea behind this came out of a survey of American public in which people said they felt better if they lived more sustainably, if they took individual steps to be more sustainable. And so the Feel Better campaign is focused on the power of consumer demand, you know. And so, I mean, we're a small outfit. I don't want to sort of over, overplay our, our impact. But the idea is, is that individuals can make a difference. And um, uh, I was a, a colleague of Henry Spira, who was one of the most successful animal advocates in the country in the 19th, 20th century. And Henry showed me that an individual can, in fact, make a huge difference. Um, and so, so this is something that, you know, the, the world looks like it's going to hell in the handbasket, but um, we just have, you have to be an optimistic pessimist. You know, the data show would say you should be pessimistic, but in order to get up and try and change it, you have to be an optimist. So, uh, so my, my advice is um, temper your pessimism with optimism and let's get, get out there and actually do something about it. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And I'm a firm believer of, uh, you know, small but mighty or small is beautiful. All of those lines, those are all things that I, I believe in very strongly. Um, and I'm also going to throw out there in the, uh, the, the chat, probably during lunch break, will be the, uh, the study that was done um, about Newburyport and the successful TNR program that we had there over the years um, yeah. that was written by Dan Spihar and uh, Peter Wolf. So I'll yeah. make sure I get that link in there so people can have that in their toolkit of successful, you know, TNR projects that have happened over time. Um, but um, Andrew, Dan, uh, Dr. Rowan, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. this was fantastic. Great information. Um,